Welcome to the Renactors Corner. In this episode, we'll talk to the new guys, how to get started in the hobby, what kit you should buy first, and how do you know when you're hit? As in, you know, shot. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in again to another episode of the Reenactors Corner. Um, this is Chris speaking to Lasse again, and today we are going to talk about something that a lot of people asked us to do an episode on, which was how to get started in reenacting. How do you get started in reenacting? Well, um, Lasse, you and I were chatting a little bit before we started recording, and I think we realized that we're going to have kind of different, very different person. And I'm from America, and your experience in getting started in reenacting and how somebody else in Europe might get started in reenacting is going to be different from how I got started and how a lot of people in America got started. So um, I look, kind of look forward to um, sharing some ideas. Uh, some of them are going to apply to everybody in the audience. Some of them are going to be specific to uh, one area or another. So um, I, I think it'll be a fun discussion. Well, let's, Let's just say from the outset, something that I think is the number one most important thing for a new person to know. If someone were to ask me, um, look, I'm interested in getting started in reenacting. What do I need to know? I would tell them that the learning curve when you start is extremely steep, um, which is to say that for those of us who do historical reenacting, there's a lot, a lot of information that we kind of keep in our heads that we are bringing to bear on everything that we do. So when you show up at the event as an established reenactor, there's a million things that you kind of already know how it's going to be. You already know what your uniform is that you're wearing and, and what that symbolizes and what it means. And you know what kind of tent you're going to be using and um, kind of how your day is going to go and how to put your gear on and, and how to use a can opener and a million things like that, that at your first event, you're, you're really unlikely to know any of these things. Reenacting before you go. Part of becoming a reenactor is about learning more than anything else. It's about learning and it's about learning a lot because there's a lot of information that you need. And if you have to do this all by yourself, if you're going to think, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to find all of this information. I'm going to collate all this information all by myself or just with the help of people on the internet who might be strangers. It's going to be very, very, uh, it's likely to be very, very difficult, not impossible, but it's much, much, much easier if you have somebody or ideally a group of people who can show you the ropes and help you navigate the oftentimes very challenging and confusing uh, mountain of information that you've got to digest to get started. Um, and that is the number one reason why I recommend that anyone who has the ability to do so, if you want to get started in reenacting, the way to do that is to join a unit in your area. Find, find out about the units, find out about the events, and then make a choice from one of the units that is available to you. Because Starting as a new recruit in an established unit that has knowledgeable and experienced reenactors, it makes all the difference in the world. Well, I'll, I'll say, like, I'll just give a little bit of my own background. It's kind of related to this, like, um, the way that I got started in reenacting was I did it actually by going on to a directory of reenactment units and then looking at all of the different websites for all of the different units that were in my region. And then from what each of those websites portrayed, I chose the unit that appealed to me the most based on how they described themselves. And that is still a method that I think is a valid method and that um, is going to work for probably most of the people listening to this, um, most of whom are living in a region that already has existing reenactment units and events. Now I know Lassa for you it was it was different when you got started, right? It was uh, it was uh, very different because when I started 
uh, with uh, World War II reenacting, there were basically no World War II reenacting in the entire country I live in. Uh, one option yeah. was to go to Sweden, which is the neighboring country, but from where I used to live, that would be a good 12 to 14 hour drive across the border uh, to even get to any event. So I decided to just start a World War II German reenacting in Norway. And I I started my own unit and I had no reenacting experience whatsoever. And it's been a very long and very hard run. I mean, as um, as every new reenactor has, they, they have some bad ideas about how to do stuff. And you figure out maybe that's not a good idea. So we had a lot of like dead ends. Well, what you say, we started from the bottom, now we're here. That's really cool. And uh, that's kind of inspirational. And I think that that should give hope to people who maybe really don't have any reenactment going on in their region, that uh, despite the challenges, it's something that can certainly be done. Um, so I think most of what I'm what I want to talk about today is is going to be directed at those people who um, can join units that are local to them. Uh, but definitely, um, we can talk about how people could do something like what you did and basically create um, a reenactment scene in a region where it doesn't exist. Yeah, we can get back on back to that. Yeah. So something that um, I found uh, many for many years, I was the primary recruiting guy for um, the unit that I was in, the unit that I originally was in when I when I got started in reenacting, and it, something that I found. Uh, that was kind of funny to me or a, a, misunder a misunderstanding that people have is they would say, well, where are you guys based? And I'd say, well, we're based in New England, but we do events all over the northeastern part of the U.S. And they would be like, no, like, where are you guys based? Like, what town are you based out of? And th that's not like how it really works, right? Like the population density of reenactors in the world is um, it's not like... Uh, there's 10 reenactors in every town. There might be 10 reenactors in a state. There might be 100 reenactors in a state, but they're spread out. So as a reenactor, if you're going to be participating in reenactment events, for most people, that's going to require you traveling to where the events are. You might go um, four hours west um, to go to an event. And then the next month you might go four hours East to go to the event. And maybe both of those are the local events to you, right? I mean, they, um, for mo when most people talk about local events, they're not fortunate enough to be talking about an event that they could walk to from their house. For me, if, if an event is two and a half hours away, it's, it's local. Um, and so, um, when you're when you're looking at reenacting, maybe don't look so much at like, okay, well, where exactly do these people live? Maybe start with looking at events. What are the closest World War II reenactment events that are currently happening that are closest to my house? Um, and that, like I say, there, some of them might be to the north and some of them might be to the south. And then look at those events and try to figure out um, how can I get in touch with the units that participate in these events? Some of them might be public events. And if they are, that's ideal because you can go and see for yourself. Um, look at their setups, talk to them, tell them that you're interested in getting started and reenacting and ask them, are, are you accepting recruits? Almost every unit is. Um, would it be possible for me to get started? What are the requirements? What's the email address or the phone number or who's the person to talk to? And they'll tell you everything that you need to know. If the events are not public events, if they're private tacticals or immersion events, um, you could you could join, maybe try to find if the event has an event page on Facebook and you could um, you could join that event group and maybe post in there and say, hey, this event takes place in my region and I'm interested in attending next next time it happens. Um, are there any units that attend that maybe are interested in having me as a recruit? And people will contact you. People will compete with each other for new recruits. It's, it's competitive. People want you on their team. Um, and so once you figured out who the units are, then it's a matter of looking at what every unit offers 
and determining which one is the best fit for you. You kind of got to think about, uh, realistically, think to yourself, what do I want to get out of this? Do I want to be able to ride in, in tanks and shoot machine guns? Do I want to... Um, do I want to be in a unit that is more like public facing that does more public types of events? Or do I want to be in a unit that has like more commemorative functions or do I want to do it just for fun? Or do I want to have a hardcore authenticity attitude and get as real as possible? Um, figure out what your own priorities are and then look at how each unit describes itself and think which of these units uh, best suits the priorities that I have. And with that, it's also important to um, to touch on that. Uh, even though you, as a new reenactor, may be more interested in, for example, the SS, but maybe it's better for you to join a here unit because it's either closer to you, it fits the description that you you're looking for, like what you're looking for in a unit, as well as it's like what you're doing and the people in the unit are more important than the clothes you're having on you. Absolutely. Um, I also find that people's interests change once they actually get into it. Um, because if you're not currently a reenactor, there's a lot about reenacting, about the hobby of reenacting that you're not aware of. And when you get started in the hobby, you're going to learn about it. And maybe all your life you've been super passionate about um, a certain buff and SS unit. But then when you get started in reenacting, you might find out that the unit that, that does that, um, division is a really bad fit for you. And there might be some other, uh, reenactment unit that's portraying a unit that you've never even heard of a unit type or branch of service that you never even thought about, but it, it suddenly appeals to you so much. Um, so definitely, yeah, that's a great point. Keep an open mind with regard to things like specific portrayals and unit types. Um, as I mentioned on the first episode of this podcast, when I got started in reenacting, I assumed that I was going to do a World War II American, uh, army soldier impression, maybe an American soldier in the Pacific, because that was what my grandfather was. And it was his stories that got me interested in World War II. But when I looked at the different units, well, first of all, I realized that there really were no events near where I live where I could portray a soldier in the Pacific. Everything was um, kind of European theater focused. And then once I accepted that simple fact um, and I looked at the American units and the German units, there, were the, there was only one unit that appealed to me and it happened to be a German army unit. And that's what I've done ever since. And I never regretted it, even though it wasn't what I set out to do. It was, it was what was best for me. It was what was most fun for me. Um, so you as a brand new reenactor might have an experience like that as well. There is a list about uh, reenactment units, at least in, in North America, which we will put into the uh, podcast uh, description, where you can uh, find um, basically all or most uh, reenactment units in North America, as well as their contact information. Yeah, I... I... I made and I maintain that list and um, I have to update it. There's some, some people have contacted me asking me to add their unit. So maybe I'll, I'll get that done maybe even before this podcast airs. Um, Then you need to be quick. Well, I will, uh, I'll do my best (laughs) or I'm updating it all the time. And certainly look, when, if someone were to contact me and say, hi, uh, I live in the same state as you and I'm interested in reenacting and I'm a brand new reenactor and I don't know what the events are and I don't know what the units are. I am certainly going to be more than happy to help you um, and anybody in any group really who's the contact person is going to do this and they're going to say, here are the events, here are the different units, here are the different attitudes, and then you can contact the other people in those units um, and, and take it from there. Um, because everybody wants re- new reenactors to find the group that's the best fit for them. It's not in anybody's best interest. If someone came to me and they said, look, um, you know, what you guys do is totally different from what I want to do, but I'm going to join you guys just because I found you first. I'll tell them, listen, there's another unit, another local unit that's a better fit for you. And I'll, I'll kind of direct them in, in that direction. Um, which in fact, most of the people who contact me to join my unit, I tell them to join other local units because um, I think that my unit is um, 
has limited appeal compared to other units that might offer experiences that are more desirable for somebody who's brand new. To it. But like, like the bottom line here, I guess, and I, I really can't repeat this often enough, is just that um, if there is a unit that you can join, even if it's not, even if it's not perfect, any unit that you can join to start is going to give you a huge advantage over people who don't have any unit at all that they can join and who have to go it alone. So, um, you know, even if you're in that unit for just a year and then you decide, you know what, I'm sure this isn't what I want. I'm going to start off on my own. You're going to be miles ahead of people who started at zero all by themselves. 100%. And I got first hand experience in exactly that. Yeah. I guess, I guess now might as well be a good time to kind of drop the, the truth, the uncomfortable truth bomb here, which is that when you are a brand new reenactor, you're going to have some, you're going to look, you're going to have some bad ideas. I'm not going to sugarcoat this at all. Like I was a reenactor. I was a new reenactor and I had all kinds of terrible ideas and I didn't understand why they were bad. And I said to other reenactors in the group that I had joined, um, Hey, I've got this great idea. And they would say, well, Chris, uh, that's that idea isn't as good as you think it is. And and they would explain to me why it was a bad idea. And maybe their explanation made sense to me in that moment, or maybe it didn't. But over time, I came to realize that these ideas that I thought maybe like I was the first person ever to think about this, um, <laughs> that they were, I wasn't, you know, right? Like I, I wasn't inventing this. Other people, here we are um, in the year 2019, World War II reenacting has been a thing for decades, and there have been a lot, a lot of people who have come through this hobby, and they have had all kinds of ideas, and uh, there's, there's, there's always improvement, right? And there's always fresh ideas, and don't, don't be afraid to voice your ideas, but understand that some of the ideas that you're going to have are not going to work. And I'll give you an example from my own past, right? Uh, a, a couple of examples. Um, I was always really, really interested in um, the Luftwaffe Flakhelfer, the Hitler Jugend personnel who late in the war were attached to the Luftwaffe as auxiliaries and served um, firing flak guns and even in some cases firing flak guns against tanks and, and personnel, um, especially on the Eastern Front as the Russians neared. To me, this is such an amazing piece of history, and it's something that a lot of people, a lot of people, particularly in America, really don't know very much about. And I had done some reading about it, and I was determined to do this as an impression. But what I didn't really think through was, first of all, at what event is it going to make sense to have one person dressed up as a Luftwaffe flak helper? It, it, these were... Um, people who worked in teams and me doing it all by myself, I was never going to be able to do it in a way that made any sense. Um, another example was um, like, look, like I don't have a flak cannon. The, the flak cannon is kind of important for the flak impression, generally speaking. And um, I, this is kind of an important piece of equipment for that. And I was never going to have it and I was never going to be able to afford it. Um, and then another thing is that the Luftwaffe Flak Helfer uniform isn't even so I was going to have to either buy and wear a fragile, very collectible and very expensive historical garment or I was going to have to somehow I don't I don't really know, right? Like like buy an original one and then give it to a skilled tailor who could make a pattern from it and then source the right kind of materials and then find someone who can manufacture this thing. I mean it's crazy, right? It's never going to happen. Um, but that, that's an, an example of an idea that I had when I was, when I was a new reenactor that, uh, with time it, it came, came out, it was just not going to be a winner. Um, and then another kind of less involved one was, uh, we were offered to do a public display on a, a ship, a big world war II U S military ship. And, um, the idea was, well, what if we did a battle on the ship? Right. What if we like had like a <laughs> right? I, I, it's laughable on the face of it. You're laughing already. I mean, it's totally ridiculous. But it's it's like this is a great idea. You know, it's like this is the worst idea. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. You know? I can imagine a new guy going like, "Ah, oh, that's gonna be that's gonna be so cool, like a battle on a ship." Yeah, I had played like some video game that had like 
room to room combat on a battleship. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that it, it's cool, but then it's like, did anything like that ever happen? Does that make any sense? Is that not the most unsafe thing? Like, do you want to go deaf? You're going to go deaf. Um, and how's the public going to see this? How is any of this going to work? This is, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and, and any new reenactor I think is going to have ideas like that. And, um, I, I mean, I was talking to someone else about this this week, but there is a level of perspective and a level of understanding that you can only get through time in reenacting. It really doesn't, it's great. If someone comes to this hobby and they are a PhD historian who's written uh, textbooks about the Eastern Front, that's awesome. And I am in awe of their their knowledge of World War II. And I acknowledge that their knowledge of World War II is much greater than my own limited knowledge. But there are aspects of reenacting that aren't the same as, as knowing about World War II. There are things to know about reenacting. What makes an event work? What make what is, is uh, harmful to an event? What's helpful to an event? what's the best way to organize an event? Um, you know, like things like that, that are, that there's only one way to learn those things and that's to be a reenactor over time. So it's, it's important to listen to people who've been reenacting for, for longer than you have when you're a new person, because these people are going to have an understanding and a perspective that you don't have. And it's not about, um, ageism or anything like that, right? Like, a like a guy who's 24, who's been reenacting since he was 18, he's going to know more about the hobby than a guy who's, who's 40 and, and started reenacting two months ago. It's not about age. It's about, it's about experience. There's value in that. And um, so, so don't lose sight of that and take it for what it's worth. All right. So let's say I just found out about this hobby, World War II reenacting. Uh, I found this page called um, World War II Militaria dot com or something and they got lots of cheap stuff and i'm just gonna buy that isn't that a good idea that's the worst idea and unfortunately that's um the idea that a lot of new people have and i if you're a person listening to this and thinking about getting started in the hobby uh just forget about buying like gear for right now um do not buy any gear and if you buy all the cheapest stuff uh, you're you're going to have problems when you get started in reenacting. But if you buy all of the most expensive stuff, you're probably also going to have problems when you get started in reenacting because every unit has its own guidelines and everybody is doing an impression that's a little bit different. Um, there are very few items that truly apply to even the majority of um, World War II impressions. On, with regard to almost every single item of uniform and equipment that you can get, there are variations that are kind of, that create important distinctions. Um, right down to things like what kind, what the material of the buttons should be on your uniform is in some ways dictated by what you what you're portraying, what unit you're portraying, what year you're trying to portray, and so on and so forth. So. The first thing to do is to hook up with a unit and they will tell you what you should buy and they'll tell you what's most important. You'll find that any group that you're going to be joining, almost any group, is going to be friendly and they're going to be helpful because they're eager for recruits. And so they probably have loaner gear. Most units maintain a, a, a large or a small stockpile of extra gear so that they can kit out people so that they can come to their very first event and they don't have to buy anything and or maybe they just have to buy some small thing or something or, or something like that. And then they can come to the event and check it out and find out if it works for them. And if you do the event and you find out that it's fun, then it's time to say, okay, I realize I'm going to have to start spending some money because I'm going to have to buy the items that are needed for my kit. Um, what should I buy? Where should I buy it? And what's the priority? Uh, a lot of units, like uh, one unit might have tons and tons of boots that you could wear, but they don't have any helmets and they want you to buy a helmet first. And then another unit might have tons of helmets and no boots. So um, like when I got started in reenacting, I was using loner gear, um, 
probably for the first whole year that I did it. And every event, I would have something new that was my own, and I could give back something that was was on loan to me. Um, but it took time for me to assemble my kit. You don't have to buy the whole kit all at once in most units. You, if you show them that you're making progress and getting the gear that you need, then they'll they'll be happy to loan you stuff that they might have that's extra. Is that, is that how it works in your your unit, Lasso? That's exactly how it works in uh, my unit. Actually, we're having an event this weekend, and we're going to have two guys who has never reenacted before, and one guy who has just two events under his belt and i'm constantly getting bombardment by uh, what you say newbie questions sure one guy comes from airsofting and he has some historical knowledge and such he want to try out a hobby but he has absolutely no idea about kit details or anything like that and i mean that's fine and another guy he has a bit of a kit but he needs to borrow some of it uh, but he asked me about where can I read about more stuff about reenacting. It's it's never a good idea to start with uh, buying stuff because most probably you're going to buy the wrong stuff for the unit you're eventually going to join. Totally. Well, sometimes people will say to me, listen, I, I'm not ready to join a unit right now. Start putting together a kit that is uh, representative of a generic World War II German army riflemen uh, in 1944. And what I always tell them is that there really is no generic 1944 German army rifleman. Um, because whether somebody was on the Western Front or the Eastern Front, whether someone was in a freshly equipped uh, Volksgrenadier unit or whether they were in um, a, a garrison unit that had been maybe stationed on the Atlantic wall, these things are going to affect how a soldier is equipped and how a soldier looks. And unless you understand that, um, in some cases, almost on a unit specific level, you're not going to be able to put together a kit um, that's correct. And there's, there's not going to be a one size fits all. It's, it's unlikely that um, your generic kit is going to work in really any of the reenactment units that you might eventually want to join because, th- like I say, there really is no generic and everybody has very specific um, standards. Like in my unit, for example, we're doing a, a rear area unit that has a low priority in supply and they were forced to make do with a lot of uh, obsolete and reissued type stuff. So for for our, for later war events that we do, we tend to use a lot of earlier war stuff that is kind of worn out, reissued stuff. And because of that, we require all of our members to have a model 1940 field bus. Whereas in the unit that I was in previously, we were portraying a unit that was uh, freshly reformed and refit in March of 1943. That was a Panzer Grenadier division that likely had that definitely had a very high priority in supply and was more likely to be receiving new stuff. So we had all model 1943 stuff. Um, and some units want a mix. It, it's, it's tough and, and joining a group and learning what they, buying what they want you to buy is definitely going to be your best strategy as a brand new person. Not to even mention that it will also save you money, a lot of money. It can save you a ton of money because a lot of units have um, used gear that might be available for sale or members might be willing to sell you used gear and it's possible to um, it's possible to put together a kit at a price that's much much less than if you just went to the vendors and bought all the stuff with them. Um, and and I guess we should probably talk about um, an unfortunate truth about reenacting is that this is a hobby that takes money to get started in that way it's like a lot of other hobbies right like even like uh, bird watching or something. You've got to buy the binoculars. Almost any hobby takes money to get started. To put together a standard, to put together like a standard German soldier uniform for World War II in the United States, excluding the rifle, unless you can get some gears on uh, some deals on used gear, you're going to be paying really realistically more than a thousand dollars. It just it's it is there is a cost there. Um, that there's no way around. It's expensive. Um, but once you have all of that stuff, then you have it, right? And then you can go to events and you have all of your own stuff. Of course, 
reenacting still does cost money. Even after you get started, you're going to have to go to events to get to the events cost money, right? Transportation fees. There are registration fees at the event and you may find that um, some of your gear wears out or you decide to refine your impression a little bit and, and upgrade something or replace something with someone else. So you got to, with something else, you got to buy something new. Um, so it's not, it's not really a, a cheap, it's definitely, I'll be honest, it's just definitely not a cheap hobby. And I think it's, it's worth stating that going. Um, I mean, what do you tell guys um, in Europe about how much they should expect to pay uh, to, to do something like this lesson? When we get new people, um, they always ask, like, uh, how much do I have to pay? And uh, we give them a rough estimate for the bare necessity complete kit of around $1,500 and up. Yeah. Um, uh, but we do say that there's no need to buy absolutely all of it in a week span. Um you can like separate those uh, $1,500 over well over a year, which makes it a lot more um, manageable. And uh, we also say that we got loaner gear. You can come and try it out. If you like it, you can start buying the most uh, important stuff and you just keep borrowing stuff as you, as you go. And that has worked out uh, really great for us. When I got started in reenacting, I was working at a pizza restaurant and uh, I went to my first event wearing full loner gear. And it's really funny and embarrassing now to look at photographs of me at my very first event because I was wearing a converted Swedish tunic and you can see my black t-shirt underneath my tunic. <laughs> and I have like sideburns, you know, my haircut is bad. I didn't realize I wasn't thinking about it. Um, and then, but I loved it. I had so much fun and I was so blown away by it. And I thought it was so cool that I went into work the next day and I asked my boss, please don't schedule me any days off anymore. And I worked like, I don't know, two months, every single day I worked, I worked a shift every day. And in doing so, I was able to get enough money that I had almost my entire kit, uh, before my actual, my, my second event, um, which was a good thing that I was able to do. Uh, but of course there's many ways you can do it. You don't have to, you don't have to abandon all your days off so that you can buy it all at once. I did. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned the haircuts because uh, most units are, uh, quite, uh, strict about haircuts were one of them. I think some units are maybe too strict on haircuts, but that's a topic for our, uh, another day. But, uh, one of the new guys joining this weekend, he, um, he sports a full beard and a shoulder long hair. And he's like, hey, I, I really want to join you. And we're like, sure, we can manage that. But uh, your beard has to go and you need to cut your hair. And he's like, what, really? Is it, why is it that, do you guys take it this seriously? And we're like, yeah. Yeah. Um, any Any unit that doesn't have grooming standards for its guys is going to basically be a laughing stock. I would tell a new reenactor if the unit that you're joining doesn't make you shave a full beard or cut shoulder length hair, um, then you're gonna be you're gonna be joining a, a, a frightening bunch of individuals indeed. Grooming standards has a lot to say about the standards of the said unit. If if a unit doesn't have any standards, if they can't tell you what kind of gear you're supposed to have, if they tell you to just buy anything, um, if they tell you that wearing uh doc martin's boots is good enough or get a plastic helmet <laughs> just don't don't you're, you're you're talking to like the lowest like two the two percent of this hobby that is like the mega cringe segment of this hobby and like you don't want to be a part of what those guys are doing like you're it's yeah. embarrassing it's not people are gonna laugh at you like don't the if you're talking to a reenactment group that you've never talked to any before there's like a 98 percent chance that this group is going to be serious and and have some level of quality and some level of pride and and knowledge and understanding and skill but there's like a like a 1 or 2% chance that you're you're talking to someone who's like subnormal so um that's that's the big warning sign if if you go to meet the guy from your group and he tells you that it's okay if you have a hair and beard like Santa Claus uh just go the other way get out find somebody else or start your own unit anything would be better than that <laughs> 
even not reenacting would be better than that. Even not at all reenacting. Even taking up bird watching or model trains, just like get out. You know what I mean? You're doomed if you if you go that way. <laughs> uh, it's an ugly truth. Yeah. Now, Lassa, you uh, mentioned that you were being bombarded with newbie questions or that some people had asked you some newbie questions. And I'm trying to think of like some frequently asked questions that people have asked me when they were brand new reenactors. Like one of them is people say, okay, well, when the battle happens, uh, how do you know when you get hit? That's the, like, uh, that's universal. It's worldwide. Sure. That's the one everybody asks us to. So uh, if anyone else is out there wondering, how do you know when you got hit? The answer is, is that if you uh, hear a shot and you don't know where it came from and you're surprised by it, there's like a pretty good chance that that person is shooting at you. And if you then see a muzzle flash and see an enemy who is looking at you and you didn't know who he was there, then he shot you. That's, that's what I tell people. And of course, other times, I mean, there, there are times when it's, uh, there's no doubt at all. I mean, if you come around a corner and there's an enemy and he shoots you before you can shoot him, it's, it's, it doesn't take any guesswork. Once you actually like participate in the tactical, I think it all makes a lot more sense. Yeah, it's not like airsoft or paintball where you actually feel getting hit. This is more, what should I say, a gentleman's sport, but it's not a sport. But you just take your hits. Yeah, there, it's, a ma- it's a matter of sportsmanship. Like um, you will find some, sometimes you're going to shoot at a person and they don't take a hit. And most of the time that's because they don't know that you're shooting at them. And you just kind of have to accept it and deal with it because um, that's just how it is. I mean, every time you shoot at someone and they don't take a hit because they don't know that you're shooting at them, there was probably another time that someone was shooting at you and you didn't know about it. Uh, and of course, there's some small number of people who are just jerks and refuse to take a hit. And uh, most of those people probably do uh, American airborne impressions. But that's just uh, <laughs> just how it is. Yeah. And those are usually not invited to the cool events. Yeah, that's another thing I, sh- I should have mentioned about why, how important it is to join a unit, because um, there are a lot of events are invitation only. And those are often the best events. And if you're not in a unit that gets an invite to the invitation only event, then you're not going to. So being in a quality unit, being in any unit really is almost your only chance to get invited to what, what I think are usually the best, the very best events. It's the same here in Europe as well. Um, the cool events are invite only to units. There is of course some exceptions, but most of the cool events you have to be in a good unit to be able to attend. Yeah. Trying to think of other like people questions that people have asked when they were brand new. Like sometimes people will say, um, you know, can I get a ride to the event? Uh, can I get a ride to events? Like like young kids, maybe like a say like an eighteen year old wants to join and he's just out of high school and he still doesn't have a car. Um, can I get a ride? And the answer to that is going to depend basically on where you live and where other people live. There's no like one size fits all answer to that question. If you live. Uh, an hour to the west of me, but the event is two hours to the west of me, then sure, I can probably pick you up on the way. But if you live an hour to the west of me and I want to go to an event that's an hour to my east, then it's it's not going to work out. But maybe there's someone else who's coming from from further west of you who's who's coming um, who can pick you up. So, Or maybe he can take the train or something to your place and meet you up and then you go together. I reenacted, there were years that I reenacted the car and I, I did all kinds of creative logistical solutions using public transportation to all kinds of different places to get um, picked up. Even sometimes like um, I'd get picked up by somebody in my group when he got out of work and then we would go back to his house, sleep, sleep at his house and then leave from his house in the morning. Um, stuff like that. It's where there's a will, there's a way. It's, it's just a matter of how, how many people there are coming from whatever part of the country and and figure it out for each event and take it from there definitely something that's that's doable uh we got a guy who's been in the unit for a few years i think he started in the unit when he was 15 in most of europe you can't take a license on a car until you're 18 so he still doesn't have his license but um he's probably one of the most dedicated guys and wherever the event is he will find a way to get there He's gone to events, he's, like he's traveled to events on his own, 
that's in the deepest middle of absolutely nowhere in Sweden in another country, and he just gets there. So where there's a will, there's a way. Definitely. Uh, speaking of like 15-year-olds, um, another question that people often ask me is, how old do you have to be to be a World War II reenactor? And that is also a question that doesn't really have any set answer. There are a lot of units that have um, age requirements and restrictions. Some units say that you have to be 18 years old. And oftentimes that comes out of uh, here in America, like legal legal issues, um, liability of, of a minor or whatever. Some units might even want you to be 21 years old so that uh, they don't have to worry about you maybe being a person who's not allowed to drink alcohol, who might have access to alcohol at an event. And then if something happens, it can be um, a, a legal problem, right? And then there are other units that will allow you to join when you're under the age of 18 with certain conditions. Like maybe if you're under 18, you have to have a function other than riflemen, like uh, you carry the ammunition for the squad or something like that. And then there are other units that if you're, if you're 15 years old and you're motivated or maybe even a little bit younger than that, um, then welcome aboard and, and you can do whatever you want. So um, if you are a teenager, if you're a young person and you want to get started in reenacting, contact some groups and find out what your options are. You might be surprised. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in our reenacting unit, uh, we accept everyone from 18 years old uh, down to 16 years old with, uh, uh, which is a uh, permission from their parents. And we can go slightly further down to 14 um, on certain specific um, uh, instances. Yeah, like a case-by-case basis. Yeah. I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the best and most realistic and most serious reenactors I ever reenacted with was 14 years old when he got started. And you would never have known it to look at him or talk to him that he was that young. Um, and he was a, an earnest and steadfast quality guy that I spent a lot of time with. And I often thought, you know, if I had turned this guy away when he first expressed interest because he was so young, it would have been a big loss. It would have been my loss. I mean, he brought a lot to the table. So I, I definitely think that there are there is, should be a place in this hobby for uh, younger people. Um, everybody's different. Certainly I've known... I've known people who were 55 years old that weren't half as mature as this 14-year-old kid that I reenacted with. So. <laughs> Age isn't necessarily uh, representative of how mature a person is. Totally. And age in, in reenacting is kind of an interesting thing. I mean, it, it's possible also that there are people out there who might be listening to this and thinking, well, I'd like to get started in reenacting, but I can't because I'm too old. I'm 55 or I'm 60 or whatever it is. And the reality is, is that... Um, it doesn't really work that way. Like there were people who were being drafted into the German armed forces late in World War II up to the age of 60 years old. And people who were over the age of 60 um, fought uh, in World War II with the Volkssturm or as partisans on the Eastern Front or many other different ways, um, different types of personnel. And it's not like, well, if I if I was going to get started in reenacting since I'm 50, uh, I would have to be an officer. It's it didn't work that way. They were they were drafting people who had previously been exempt from war service, who were older people, um, and they were entering the military at the lowest enlisted rank. So if you're 55 or 60 or or a little older or whatever or a lot older. Um, there's things that you can do that are totally appropriate and realistic and convincing and that would allow you to be uh, a valued and important member uh, and a totally authentic member of a reenactment group. So don't be afraid to get involved. You know, you can teach an old dog new tricks. The most, I've said this before, the, the single zoniest guy, the best guy that we've got in my group, he's like, he, I think he might be 65 years old. Uh, but his kit is absolutely perfect. He he's very fit and has better stamina and ability to withstand things like cold than um, guys that we've had in the group who were um, like 21 years old. Uh, regarding age, it is very important to realize that this isn't the modern U.S. Army drafting 19, 20 year old kids. This is a desperate nation that is totalitarian controlled. And they're, they're in a total war state. Yeah, like 
I think that you're hitting on something where that is the genesis of a lot of misconceptions in the hobby and, and especially, or maybe not especially, but definitely for new people, which is that there's a lot of crossover between modern military service and World War II military service or World War II German military service. And the reality is that's not true. I Anybody of any age, right, or whatever job someone has had, they might have things that they can bring to the table that are going to be an asset in reenacting. And there are definitely things that soldiers in modern militaries learn that will help them in reenacting and that are good for them. But there are other things where you might have to unlearn some things. Like when I'm at a reenactment and I'm watching a unit doing rifle drill and I'll see a guy maybe involuntarily start doing some move with his rifle that I know is like a modern Thing. You know, this is an example of somebody where um, not only do you have to learn how to do it the German way, but you have to kind of unlearn the way that you learned in the modern military. So it's almost a hindrance in some ways. So it's, it, it has, I guess, the bottom line on modern military service that it has um, it has some advantages. It has some disadvantages. It has some things that carry over and some things that don't carry over. And you just have to be willing to have an open mind and learn just like anybody else. You know, whether you're whether you're a veteran and, you know, and with with the respect that 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 you have earned there, certainly, or whether you've never served a day in the military. Um, when you get started in reenacting, there are going to be some things that come naturally to you and there are going to be things that you're going to have to learn from from the start, no matter what your background is. And a good unit will have a uh, pretty smooth uh, recruiting um, stage which they'll introduce you to all the different kinds of stuff you need to know. A lot of units do training events, and um, that might be an ideal first event for someone to go to um, to go to one of these training events where you're going to learn things like the commands, um, how to do rifle drill, squad tactics, how to march. Um, it's It's a lot. And these are things that um, are important in reenacting. Um, and you need to be able to become proficient in these skills. You need to know things that World War II soldiers knew. You need to know how to do things that they knew what how to do. So a training event, if, if you could find out, a, if you're interested in joining a group and they give you an opportunity to attend one of their training events, jump on that because that, that's a great way to get started. It's the best way to get started. Yeah. Um, I've also, I've, I've found like... Uh, Public display events can be kind of a mixed bag if that's your first event. Because if you can kind of hang out in the background at a public display event, um, then you're going to watch at a busy public event, you might watch endless lines of tourists and spectators going up to the guys in your unit and asking them all kinds of questions. And if you just kind of absorb that information, you can walk away with a, a much broader knowledge of, of exactly what you're you're dealing with that pertains specifically to your impression. Of course, the problem with that is um, it's probably reasonable for a spectator to think that they can walk up to you and ask you questions. And if you're brand new to the hobby, you might have, you might not have the answers, in which case um, there is no, no harm in simply saying that you don't know. It's better to say you don't know than uh, start spreading um, false information. Yeah, if you don't know, just say you don't know, and and um, your unit will probably tell you. Hey, if you if if someone asks you a question and you're not sure about the answer, uh, just direct them over to me or to this specific person. Tell them that they're the guy to talk to about that, and and that'll it'll be out of your hands, and you can get back to um, listening more and and learning more. One of the guys um, who's uh, doing one, the event uh, this weekend, he has done one or two events with us previously, but he's the kind of guy who likes to read about um, how to, uh, like, read information. Uh, is there any information you can read available? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, there is one book that I recommend always to people when they're brand new to the hobby, um, and I guess we could put a link to it in the show notes. It's called... Um, German Army Uniforms and Insignia, 1933 to 1945 by uh, Brian L. Davis. 
this is an old book. I think it's from the 70s. Maybe it's even from the 60s. And I don't actually know if it's even still in print. But there were so many copies of this book printed in so many different editions that um, it's a it's a super cheap book to buy on the internet on Amazon. You can you can get this book for five dollars. And what's great about this book, it, it really gives you tons and tons of information about the different models of different uniforms and and headgear items and um, information about insignia and when it was introduced and what types of insignia were worn with what types of uh, in what types of units and things like that. And this is stuff that is definitely important to know as a reenactor. It's maybe not the most important thing, but you'll find if you're talking to other reenactors um, or if you're, you're trying to do research um, let's say you're trying to do unit specific research and you find some photographs that are unique to the unit that you're trying to portray. It's definitely going to help you convey that information to other reenactors. If you can say, all right, this guy is wearing a, a late war uniform and he's got a M 43 cap on and that kind of thing, something that people can understand instead of trying to describe it. So, um, and also it has a lot, a lot of photographs in it. And the photographs show you all kinds of different things, ranging from soldiers wearing their dress uniforms to pictures of soldiers in the field where you can look at their equipment and see, okay, he's got his gas mask canister um, slung over this shoulder and he's got his his entrenching tool and his bayonet, um, you know, in such a position. And then you can kind of um, sort of memorize those photos or use those photos as a guide to your own portrayal. And I've often said that um, there's more information in that book than you're likely going to encounter on like reenactor discussion groups on Facebook in a year. It's, it's a very good book for concentrated, factual, uh, good information. And I think that it's a very handy thing for a new reenactor to have. Certainly. But there's more to reenacting than just a uh, kit. But sadly, there's no um, book where you can, like, um, there's no one-on-one on how to reenact available. Yeah, if, if there is, I certainly have never seen it. And um, I would love to I would love to see such a book. I think there are a few reasons why there isn't a book like that. I think a lot of information is unit-specific, so something that might be absolutely crucial to a reenactor in one type of unit is going to maybe be a red herring or, or just totally not valid for someone who's doing a different impression. Um, and then of course, if it's going to talk about, uh, well, there's certainly things that um, I think would probably almost be obsolete as soon as the book comes out, right? Like if, if it's going to talk about events uh, for instance, I mean, that events change all the time, but there are some, what, what I tell people is to look online. There are some, there are some really good reference um sort of compendiums on the internet that are geared towards reenactors that have a mixture of uh, research-based articles that are that are maybe based on like looking at specific items that soldiers used and um, articles that are written based on looking at analysis of original photos and some articles that might be translations of wartime reference material, stuff from manuals so that you understand the regulation ways that soldiers were supposed to do things. Um, and I think we can put those links um, in the show notes as well. Absolutely. There's uh, two different websites that has uh, some nice compilation of articles. One of those sites is yours, and the other belongs to a uh, very old reenacting unit now in the U.S. Yeah, the um, the first one is on uh, our Sickerings Regiment 195 website, which is... Uh, Festung.net. And then the other one is um, on the Erstetzug website. Erstetzug are uh, kind of a mid-Atlantic based German army reenactment group uh, from the USA. And they, they've had that website up since, I don't know, the early 2000s. And it's kind of the gold standard for reenactment unit websites and that it's got tons of articles on there that were uh, very helpful when they were new and that people still refer to today. And everything on there is worth looking at. If you're a brand new reenactor, um, you know you can go through and just read every article and come out knowing a lot more than you went in. Uh, there's um, you also got various uh, Facebook groups available 
um, Facebook is kind of a dying medium when it comes to reenactment discussions. So uh, Chris and I, we're running a forum that's called soldatenforum.com where you can discuss uh, with other reenactors. Yeah. Um, I, I don't even think it's worth even talking about Facebook groups that people could join because the way that if things are going on Facebook where groups are being deleted uh, monthly, if not weekly at this point, um, you know, anything, anything I would tell someone to look at may or may not be there by the time we're done having this conversation. So, you know, there, there's good and bad on Facebook for now, but it's, I, I don't think that's going to be a, a place where the chatter can really be for too much longer. But something else I would tell to uh, people who are brand new reenactors is uh, be, be careful on social media when you, when you get started in reenacting. And probably if you join a unit, the people in your unit will tell you this too. Um, you got to really kind of consider like the effects that pictures of you at reenactments can have on people that you might not expect might have a negative reaction. So um, just be smart about it. You know, understand that a picture of you in a World War II German uniform with a machine gun, you might think it's the coolest picture ever taken, but um, people in your family or people at your office might not. So, um, you know, that's that's something to just just be aware of when, when you get started. All right. Let's say I, um, I join a unit, um, but I don't want to be a rifleman. I want to be a assault engineer wielding a flamethrower. Sure. Um, you know, that's cool. And I can relate to that. When I got started in reenacting, I wanted to do some specialist stuff too. But part of this circles back around to this like bad ideas concept I was talking about. Where, um, you know, there may be a way for you to represent a guy with a flamethrower. But at most events there probably isn't going to be. So what I tell people to do is um, concentrate on the basics first. Think about what a soldier would have learned in basic training, regardless of whether he was a clerk or a machine gunner or a tank driver, right? You're going to learn how to do, you're going to learn how to march. You're going to learn how to do the manual of arms with rifle. You're going to learn... Um, basic military commands, uh, eyes left, eyes right, that kind of stuff. And that's what, as a brand new reenactor, you should be focused on. Definitely don't be afraid to indulge your passions in terms of thinking about it, talking about it. Hey, what if, um, what if I got a motorcycle? Or what if we had a mortar? Or what if we had this other crew served weapon? What if I got a machine gun? Um, but that shouldn't be where you should start from. You should start from a position of learning the basics. And in most reenactment groups, typically and traditionally, the basic is portraying an infantry rifleman. And I think that that's a really good place for for everybody to start. This maybe is changing a little bit now because there are maybe more units that are doing like rear area stuff or things that might be more inclusive for people who maybe they're out of shape or for whatever reason, they don't want to portray a line infantry guy. Um, there are roles for people like that. But for for most people getting started in the hobby, consider putting in a, a year or two or three, uh, being a rifleman and learning everything there is to know about this most basic representative aspect of the ground soldier fighting a war before you decide to jump in with two feet on being a, a rural police officer or something. Yeah, um, myself, I do a, a side impression, which is a Kriegsberichter, which is basically a war correspondent. And I wouldn't be able to do that impression as good as I am doing it. That sounds um, that sounds really narcissistic of me. But no, uh, I think <laughs> I think it's totally valid. You know, I think that there's self awareness in that and. I could say the same. In fact, um, even my whole unit now uh, where we're doing a rear area impression, um, I think being grounded and like having experience of portraying a rifleman gives me perspective that I can apply to this, that if I, if I had gone in without that perspective, I wouldn't be doing it as well. Exactly. And I also have a side impression of a Schreiber, with, which is 
paperwork and filling out the Zoldbuch and, and all of this stuff. And uh, but every every Schreiber in the Wehrmacht was also trained to have a, and use a rifle if he had to. So basically, no matter what your um, no matter what your focus eventually becomes, that time that you spent as a rifleman um, for the majority of people is going to be very valuable, very useful time. Yeah, uh, start with the basics. That's the uh, that's the best tip. Absolutely, um, and and that information that you're going to learn is going to help. No matter what profession you do, eventually decide someday to pursue. Um, you know, one one more example of this is uh, like almost every event that happens traditionally in America, like the units that I attend, is um, after D Day. And the reason for that is because um, most events are kind of Western Europe focused and most events are Western Front where you need to have the GIs. So it's going to be after the invasion. So it's it's great to be interested in the early years of the war in France 1940 or, you know, the Eastern Front in 1942, but understand that the majority of what this hobby is about is something else. Uh, so have, being able to do late war events is almost a necessity for anyone who's trying to join an established reenacting scene. It doesn't mean that you can't do early war events too, or you can't put, have a, a sub impression that's earlier, but, um, you know, some things just are the way they are and you, you kind of have to go along with how the way things have always been. And that's pretty much the same in Europe as well. Uh, there's uh, slightly more focus on the Eastern Front here, but uh, there's there's the good old D-Day, post-D-Day, 1944 uh, events. Yeah, and there and I imagine that there will always be events like that. I mean, there will always be Normandy events. There will always be a Battle of the Bulge to do somewhere. And so being able to do those events... I, I'm not aware of any established um, reenactment groups of any size, really, that that would say, "Well, we can't. We're not going to be able to do 1944 because we do an early war impression." Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. They wouldn't be able to do events. Yeah, like I know a few units who specialize in a mid to early war uh, impression, but they. Every every single guy has the ability to throw on some late war kit and go to an event. Sure. Yeah, I would imagine it to be the case. Um, and I don't want to alarm people. Like you, you don't have to have. In, for most most of the time, you really don't have to have different uniforms for different events. The the standard wool uniform that you're going to have to buy is is going to work for you in almost every event that you're going to go to. Of course, later on. Um, if you're like me or a lot of other reenactors, you get a case of gear acquisition syndrome and you start to buy other uniforms that maybe you don't need. But uh, I guess that depends on the person. Yeah, that's um, it's actually uh, one of the good things with the German kit is that it uh, most of the German kit is quite universal from, say, 1942 to 1945. And like, for example, American uniforms where they changed boots three times just in 1944 and 1945 alone yeah and of course depending on what your impression is there there are kit items that are going to work from 19 1935 to 19 say you know Absolutely. An, aluminum, an aluminum belt buckle from from 1935 is for most impressions going to be uh totally applicable or from 1936 whenever they introduced that thing uh, it's going to be just as applicable for 19 but but then again other things aren't so that's that's where um you know following the the guidance of a unit becomes important and uh reading in the book and reading in the book of course if you don't have a unit to join then you come up with these things on your own which um which i guess is what you had to do yeah that's been a very long run i um a friend of mine and i started uh, the unit in uh, it started forming around 2009 I guess it didn't really form into some serious reenactment thing until 2013 um, but even then it was like a very long run we bought lots of kit we bought like 
cheap kit, which we thought looked good, but was horrible, and we didn't know any better. We were supposed to be unit commanders. It was a disaster, and it took years to really get to any point where, like, we can actually go to uh, events with other units and be accepted. Because wow. we basically didn't know... Like... We we just didn't know. Uh, unit research was hard. Uh, finding out where to buy kit and what kit to buy. Uh, even writing the kit list was uh, was very difficult because it took it it takes a lot of time and uh, buying and trying and like vendors try to sell you a product. They may use photos that makes it look better than it is. So we buy it. We're disappointed after comparing to originals, etc., etc. Um, like there's so much uh, you have to learn if you start your own unit. It's it's very difficult. Sure, I imagine it must be such a challenge. I mean, I just can't even imagine trying to buy kit, you know, and not have that, not have somebody that you can kind of turn to, somebody that you know and can trust, and say are you aware of this product? You know, is it any good? Uh-huh. And, and just have to kind of buy it and see it's, it sounds so daunting. Yeah. Um, one of our primary resources was uh, looking at uh, other reenactment units, for example, in the States and looking at their uh, publicly available uh, kit lists on their website. But like looking back at that, those kit lists were literally shit. So we bought shit because yeah. we didn't know any better. Sure. There's also like, I think that that is a good starting point to do some additional research, looking at these like kit lists of other units. But um, sure, like you say, uh, some of them are going to be total garbage. And there's also some units out there that will make these like really elaborate kit lists that, uh, of these phenomenally detailed and expensive things that you have to buy. But then when you see this unit in the field, you realize that they don't even adhere to that list themselves and that they kind of put that list out there to make them look better than they really are. Yeah, that is true. Uh, you're also talking about uh, bad ideas new reenactors had. Uh, the problem with us was that we had bad ideas and we had no one to stop us. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's it's just been an extremely long run, uh, years and years and years of just uh, trying and failing. But, I mean, um, I'm pretty happy with uh, where we're now. Yeah, you guys have a really good reputation. And I, I, I think it gives, I think it is inspirational, right? And it should give hope to other people who might be listening to this who are like, you know, I'm not aware that there's any World War II reenacting in my entire country. And and how could I get into this hobby? And that it, it is possible. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. Yeah. Um, like, if any listener is in such a position that the closest reenacting unit is like a 10, 12-hour drive away, maybe in another country, then um, I say just do it. But... Uh, Go online, go to, for example, the Sulatan Forum. Uh, try to get connected to uh, with other unit commanders who has the experience of running a unit. Yeah, I think, I wonder if it would be possible to do it completely alone. That This is like on the like extreme outer edge of like what is reenacting or what is possible. Like what if you're the only person within a 12 hour drive who's interested in this stuff at all could you basically be a world war ii reenactor all by yourself um i don't know if anyone's ever done it it would be it would be hard but maybe not completely impossible to do some some kind of immersive event where you put on the kit and you're out there by yourself um doing a patrol or, you know, pretending that you're trying to get back to your lines or whatever it is, but definitely like it becomes so much better and easier and more practical. If you have even just one other person to start. Yeah. And 
if you are starting a unit, try to have a um, try to be uh, publicly available. Try to have a presence um, in the public space because you will find people who want to try this hobby. Um, we went from me and my friend to now having. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think we've gone through like 40 different people over the years who's uh, come and gone. Some have stayed. We're getting new people all the time. Yeah, we should... I'll I'll throw, maybe throw out there that some people get started in reenacting and they absolutely love it and they're just crazy about it and it's the only thing they ever talk about. But then after a year, their interest shift to something else and they just and other people get started in reenacting and wind up doing it for 30 years or more. So um, I think the average, the average is about five years in, in America or like among people that I've known where, um, you know, for every guy that, that drops out right away, there's, there's a guy that that's there for 10 years. But um, I feel like after about five years, um, that's where a lot of people maybe fall away and, and people who stay after five years maybe are more likely to stay with it for years and years longer than that. Um, so um, that's kind of just a reality of, of reenacting that maybe is worth knowing about. If it's something you're interested in doing, it might not be something you want to do forever or it might. I can't imagine ever not doing this. I've been doing this for almost 20 years and I, I hope to continue to do this for at least 20 more. Well, do it till you drop. I would love to do this till I drop. I, mean, I can't, I can't imagine a time <laughs> of ever, even if I just become some like hideously fat, like elderly man, like I'll find some way to, do this. you know, I'll, even if, even if I become too, too corpulent and just uh, ancient um, so that I can't even go to events, I'll find some way to reenact by myself. I mean, I got to reenact. I'll do it. I love doing it. Can always uh, just buy a blue cooler, fill it with beer. Yeah, get a mobility a scooter. Event. You know, put a, <laughs> put a, the uh, Balkan Kreutz on it, and uh, whatever. But um, however you get into the hobby, um, welcome to the best hobby in the world. I th- I certainly think it's. And there's, there's a lot of different approaches. There's infinite approaches to do it. There's infinite reasons for doing it. Um, your reason might be unique to you and your way of trying to do it might be unique to you, but um, go, go for it. I, I just, I encourage people to at least try. I see people, uh, I wish I had gotten involved when I was younger and I see people Sometimes they kick the tires of joining a unit and then they kind of back away. They, they feel like they're not going to have the time. They don't, they don't, they feel like they're not going to have the money. And then when they finally do eventually get started, it's always the same, man, why didn't I join years ago when I first met you? Why didn't I join years ago when I first started talking about this? This is so much fun. Yeah, we have had, uh, we've actually had, um, a few guys who's been like, yeah, maybe I should try it out one day. And they say that for years and we're like kidnapping them and taking them to the event. And they're like, wow, this is awesome. Yeah. And the day after they've spent like two grand on kit. Totally. There's only one way to know what reenactment and it's to do it. You can never know. You can basically uh any any reenactment is such a strange thing right where it's this combination of like intense history nerd uh kind of like detail mindset that thing that happens in your mind coupled with um if it's a tactical event you've got this like grown up cowboys and indians sort of a thing um where you're playing army but you're doing it in this extremely serious way um that is like this full-scale uh recreation of world war ii combat um it really is not like anything else i i can't i don't i can't think of any other kind of thing that i could relate to it and say yeah it's just like that it's like its own thing and there's a certain type of person out there that just really loves that kind of thing and whatever that type of person is that is me because um it just (laughs) it just checks all my boxes i love it and it's 
it's those times at events where you just forget that you're actually a person living in 2019 mm-hmm. and you're just suddenly there. Like you have a reenactment moment. After every big event, you can look on social media and see reenactors talk about uh, post-event depression. And that's like partially a joke and partially not a joke. Because when you come together with your team to do an event exactly the way that you want to do it, and you pull off everything that you've planned, and it feels super real, and you get out of it everything that you wanted, and you get to hang out with your friends and people that maybe you only see once a year. Um, and then you have to go back to your regular boring job. I mean, it, it certainly can can feel depressing. That's that's how much fun it is. You know, sometimes you don't want it to end. Sometimes you can't wait for it to end. That's, that's, that'd be, we could do a whole show about that. Yeah. I think that's um, what we have to say about uh, how to get started in reenacting. That's the basics, you know. Uh, to recap, it's like you want to find out about units in your area. You want to find out about events in your region. Uh, join the one that seems best for you, follow your passions, but focus on the basics. Don't start off by buying kit. Listen to what the people in your unit, listen to the experienced people and what they tell you. And if you have to go it alone, know that you're up against a challenge, but, but know that it's not impossible either. And, uh, and just, just get in there and do it, do it however you can do whatever you can. There's, uh, there's great fun at the end of it. Oh, this is kind of a backtrack here. I know we're we're kind of wrapping up, but I did want to just throw out there. um, You had mentioned the challenge of doing unit specific research when you were starting your own thing. Right. And I think maybe we should do an episode on that in the future. um, How to do unit specific research, but just like bare bones, like what were what were like your biggest tips for somebody if they're trying to start a reenactment unit to do unit specific research? What, what would you recommend? Oh, well, a Google search, I guess. Uh, okay. First off, get the very basics down. Uh, try to find a book, a, a book about your specific um, battalion or regiment, or um, if you have to for the division. Um, yeah, that's. That's the two best tips I got. Online search and look for a book. I think that's a, those are great starting points for someone in that position. Even if the book is in another language, um, if you can get your hands on it, um, if whatever illustrations that are in there, it, it's going to have information. Even if you have to painstakingly unlock parts of it a sentence at a time, I think it's worth it. German isn't a lost language. There's always a way to translate it. Totally. It's sometimes it can be time consuming. Um, if you can't read German, if you have to type it into Google Translate a sentence at a time, but it, it can definitely be done. Yeah, even if it's just for the image uh, descriptions in the book. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, that's all we got, I guess. Then. I think it is. Nice. Um, for our recurring listeners, next episode will be out the 4th of July. Okay, we hope to have it out. I, I would love to just have it out at the 4th of July. We'll see. There's rumors there will be fireworks to uh, celebrate that episode. Nice. I can't wait. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the USA. Yeah, I love those. That's, that's fun. All right. Thanks for listening. And uh, Lassa, I will talk to you later. Have a good night. Same. Uh, see you in the field. See you in the field.